position. I am here with uh, Melinda Wenner Moyer, who is the author of a fantastically titled book. And in fact, the title of the book is probably why you're listening to this, <laughs> but if you're a new listener, which is how to raise kids that aren't assholes. And I really, as a self-described smart, sweary mom and struggle boss, I really, really like, um, like the title, like the idea, like the fact that it's okay to call our kids assholes um uh especially given what we've gone through in the last year i last year i made myself and my kids little placards because we started at home um you two got to see my ass whatever no one else cares um but so mine is uh dr lindsay callen weisner principal comma uh, juggles chainsaws. Amazing. Yeah. My son's is Hunter, kind of listening. And <laughs> my daughter is Alexis, beauty with bite. So oh um, I don't know why, but um, my husband must have found these. And yesterday when I walked into my office, these were all there. And it was our first day of school. And I got so sad. Um, but. That's how I spent 80 bucks last year. <laughs> Those are so great though. I love them. Thank you. I, um, I personally struggled and my children struggled and um, they were really smart and found amazing ways to fool their teachers. And um, as I was reading this, your book is fantastic. Now it's very heady, I will say, like at first, but I will also say if you're not a science geek like Melinda and I are, <laughs> Um, and a complete research dork, and I, I get it. Um, on a Crimes of Long Island podcast, every time we do an episode, I research the shit out of it. And my co host, like, thanks me for re research. I'm like, no, no, no. Thank you for, <laughs> you know, thank you for letting me rabbit hole and then do something with it. Um, and I sort of feel like you're like that as well. I mean, oh, yeah. You started yeah. as a journalist. Yes, a science journalist, actually, all science all the time is what I have covered for like the last 15 years. I mean, and then it morphed into parenting, but the science of parenting once I had kids um, about 10 years ago. Yeah, but yeah, um, because then we want to figure out what to do with them. Exactly. I, I mean, I had so many questions from like, well, even before I had them um, and there were so few answers I felt that were satisfying that I felt like were really, you know, based in evidence. And so I just started using science to answer my own parenting questions. And that led to a column in Slate that I had for years where I basically just answered my own parenting questions <laughs> with science and published it. And it was really fun and really satisfying. But, yeah. um, but you are my hero because I love <laughs> Slate. So, I mean, but who doesn't love Slate? You know, um, it's pretty cool. It's very cool. Um, there's so many topics you covered, and I took notes about everything that interests me. Um, but so, just to, um, okay, so you start off explaining why you wrote this book as a parent, which is phenomenal. And it's, I, I actually abhor the term imposter complex, so I'm not using that, but um, it's such a hashtag, I don't like it. Not to say it isn't real, I just don't think we need a name for like self-doubt and, and self-esteem, you know, um, but you, you were very open with the fact that it was a difficult decision for you to present yourself as a parenting expert. Tell me about that. Yeah, oh gosh, absolutely. I wrestled with this for a while. Um, well, I mean, while I was writing the column for Slate, people would say, why don't you write a parenting book? Why don't you write a parenting book? And I was always like, no way am I ever writing a parenting book because I mean, I'm flailing like every other parent. <laughs> I don't know any better about anything, you know, I, and, and I just felt like the idea of telling other parents what to do, it just felt like obnoxious and presumptuous and, and, you know, and holier than thou and all, all, all these <laughs> things. And, um, and so it just, and also I have to be honest, like there was also like a, a sexism component to it where as like, as a science journalist, I always, you know, I want to be taken seriously. And I knew that writing about parenting was not always considered like a serious yeah. enterprise. Yeah. It's like quote unquote, mommy blogging. And there was a part of me that was worried that if I, 
spent too much time in the parenting sphere, I like wouldn't be taken seriously as a real science journalist anymore. So there was that in my head going on too, that I was battling with, but ultimately, you know, this was like two and a half years ago. And I just, I started really getting more and more frustrated and worried about the bad behavior I was seeing all around me that I knew my kids were hearing about, like all the me too allegations, people, some people in politics. So I felt like weren't behaving <laughs> really great. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. pretty pissed about the rapist in, con- in uh, the Supreme court myself, but yeah, actually it's, that was exactly the time that I came up with the book was October, 2018, when during all of the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm not afraid to talk about it. I actually was really pissed at having to explain this to my husband and father-in-law that every woman has been in this situation. Yeah. Like if not that drastic in some form of that situation. So, um, you know, yeah. I'm sort of no, no holds barred. Like I, that to me was a huge gender divide that I was shocked that they couldn't understand, you know? Yeah, so. I know. Yeah. It was really a difficult time. And that was like having all that go on, having Trump mock Christine Blasey Ford on TV, yeah. all these things going on at the same time. That was the moment when I was like, you know what? I think, I think I should write a parenting book. And I think it should be focused on how, how to raise good humans. Because I just, I kept thinking about like, what were my kids learning from this? Who were they going to grow up to be? And essentially, how do I make sure they don't grow up to be like these people I'm seeing? And, and this- I love that you go political. <laughs> like, I'm glad you think so. You not everybody the agrees. research. It's not like, you know, you know, but I, I love that you don't shy away from that. Yeah, it was definitely something that I thought about and talked with my editor about. And I was like, you know, but this is really, if I'm going to be authentic, like this is really what was at the root of me wanting to write the book. And I feel like I need to be honest and authentic about it. Um, And so that then also, like, I realized there was actually a lot of research. And once I realized, gosh, there's so much research on building character and values in kids, some of it is really counterintuitive. Then I realized, okay, I think I can do this and write a parenting book if it's really rooted in the research and not in like my own opinions about what you should be doing as a parent, because that's what felt, you know, not okay for me to do. But if it was rooted all in the research, I was like, I can do this. And I know I, I am good at translating research and reading it and, and, and describing it. And so like, this will be kind of my calling and I will do this particular parenting book and feel okay about it. And I think it's fantastic, but you mentioned, um, I don't know if you mentioned it in the book or I know you mentioned it in the book, but you, you, I think you also just mentioned it now, uh, sort of this feeling of how do I, how do I write a book that doesn't feel shaming or judging? And you know, the funny thing is, I don't know if you know, uh, Carla Nomberg, her book, that came, okay. Uh, yes, she's, she's lovely. Great. She's so lovely. And she says the same thing. And then um, about a year and a half ago, I interviewed um, Tina Payne Bryson, who wrote, among other things, The Whole Brain Child. I, um, I had interviewed her for uh, a follow-up book that, of course, I'm blanking on at this moment, which is super professional. But she oh, writes- Oh, there's no drama discipline or, or the baby book, the- No, it was, oh, The Power of Showing Up. The Power yes. of Showing Up. Okay. So that was amazing. And at the time I had a a co-host and um, I am the PTA whore, whereas my co-host won't go near PTA and she's much better off for it. But like, (laughs) you know, um, but it was very interesting and helpful for both of us to hear that, like, like my childhood, not such a great attachment, you know, I'll tell you that now. And so to hear, you know, Dr. Brace and be like, it's okay, you can work through it. It's a fantastic book. But even she says the same thing. Like the, the goal of writing a parent book shouldn't be to shame people. And perhaps women are slightly better at that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, that was definitely another thing, a big part of it that I struggled with. Like we have so much pressure put on us as mothers from all sides. And especially like during the pandemic, we're dealing with so much. And the last thing I wanted to do was make parents feel like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this wrong. I've screwed up my kids. Like, you know, if they've learned something new from my book, that means that they were doing it wrong before. Like that was, that was something I really worried about. And so, I mean, I tried essentially to, to just 
uh, uh, one of the ways I tried to combat that was by like weaving in my own vulnerability into the book. And Which being like, you did. I was going to say okay. that. You did. You let, you let us see you. You let us see your friends. You let us see, you know. And I literally wanted to like... I obviously interrupt a lot. It's my shtick. Sorry. It's, <laughs> no, it's it's, well, it's like, it's because I'm excited, you know, like yeah, yeah. Um, I totally wanted to like, you know, email you or Facebook you or text, whatever, and be like, oh my God, I have to tell you what happened. And then I was like, no, Lindsay, you can save that for the interview, you know? <laughs> Um, I'm glad though that you had that reaction of like wanting to engage in the and feeling comfortable, like we were friends or something. Like right, that's what I was going for. But I also am a weird one because again, we're research dorks. So like, you know, um, but you then like, you know, this is not just a book for people who dork out over research, but you you give actual strategy points. And um, you know, uh number one is uh a selflessness strategy we'll get it but my point is and okay let's give an example to so the audience selflessness strategy number one talk about validate and help your kids manage their emotions which is essentially to teach the language of emotions we'll unpack that in a little bit but just for something we were talking about before um one of the first podcasts i went on when i was advertising my book they're like so tell us the 10 steps to finding happiness and i was like what why did I send you a book? Like, why? You know, like, that was my issue. So, also, it was tough to remember them on the spot on the, you know, like two years ago. Oh my later. God. Um, yeah. You know, but um, really, this book is readable. So, I don't want to scare people away. I mean, I highly recommend this book. Um, what, what also becomes abundantly clear to me is one of the things we're really talking about is teaching our kids resilience. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you talk, you, I, you list all of the, I recently did something for, I don't remember what it was because it didn't end up paying very well, but I, it's a recording thing where you record and then you get plays per li money for people listening, um, blanking on it, but only did it once because it took forever. Uh, mm. But um, I did it about resiliency, you know, the seven C's of resiliency, you know, um, I didn't call them that because that would have been copyright, but fine. Uh, but so I was very familiar with, and I recognize these, uh, these things. You have a tremendous amount of research. Like what was the, since I'm all over the place, what was your biggest wow moment or like surprising You know, like what's stuck yeah. with you, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I think one thing that was really, really interesting. So when I researched the different kind of characteristics that I thought would be important to focus on in the book, yeah. I researched them like independently. Like I looked at, okay, let's see what the research on like selflessness and generosity says. And let's look at the research on anti-racism says, and, and they all have like very different people working in those fields, doing their own thing. They don't even often like communicate with each other or know what the other group is doing. But so one of the things that was surprising was seeing these themes, a couple of themes popping up over and over again, um, independently by these researchers who like didn't really necessarily know that the other group was also finding the same thing. Um, and one of them that just kept coming up over and over again was like, it's so important to talk to kids about things that are like complicated and even awkward and things that generally parents, I think, avoid talking about because they want to quote unquote, protect their kids innocence, yeah. or they feel like, oh, my kid doesn't need to know about this yet. So I'm talking about like race and racism and sexism and gender stereotypes and sex and pornography, like all of these things that we tend to be really nervous about talking about with kids. The research very clearly shows it's actually much better for us to in age appropriate ways, of course, talk to our kids about these things, find ways to weave them into, you know, even like regular conversations rather than like the one birds and bees conversations, for instance, like to, to be talking about sexuality and relationships and consent, like as much as possible. And that's actually very constructive. And so that was one thing that I felt like was a big theme that just kept coming up and coming up and coming up. And with race, it was really interesting because yeah, we have very different reasons for avoiding talking about race. And we have these ideas that if we talk about race, it'll make our kids racist, but like the opposite is what the research really suggests. So, um, that was like a big thing that just kept coming up over and over again. That was surprising. 
Um, I, I think it's fascinating what you're saying. I also like to say this podcast is where I talk about uncomfortable things because I would not do well at like a 1960s cocktail party. <laughs> Same. Unless, well, I don't know. I'm curious about what a black beauty is. So maybe I wouldn't do well. Who knows? Um, um, I, there was some, I'm, the race was interesting. We, uh, I'm also, I, there was a time when kids kept committing suicide in this area where I am now. And so I ended up working with a lot of suicidal teens. And so, um, my kids are probably more familiar with the idea and uh, construct and uh, someone died. Uh, it was a while ago, I had to explain, to, I had to explain to them that um, someone had died and uh, by, by suicide. Um, I'm still working my mind around the committed versus by suicide. Bear with me, listeners bear with me. It comes from a long history of struggling um and so of struggling with someone who repeatedly tries to commit see i don't know if i'm gonna be able to get there but it's not for lack of support and love um but immediately when i told my kids that this had happened because they were going to hebrew school the next day and i was pretty sure they were going to hear about it there um this were a small community my daughter's immediate question was was it your patient you know like uh no thankfully but um you know, we've, it's, they know more about mental health than they should, because my husband and I are both shrinks, you know, and um, race, we, you know, mm, I'm not saying I'm doing it, but I'm doing the best I can for now, which doesn't mean we won't and don't talk about it more in the future. I, I showed my son the George Floyd video, not the whole thing. Um, he's, he was 11, but I needed him to see what, fucked up situation that was you know yeah. um and so I agree 100 percent uh and whereas my husband he didn't want the kids to know there was anyone in the world that wasn't Jewish until they like found out you know like he would put them in a protective bubble I'm like we can't you know you mentioned that your son searched for naked people um mine searched for um naked hypnotized woman the first time wow. we found out, right? I mean, a friend of his. Very I mean, specific. Very specific. And I don't understand why a naked hypnotized woman is particularly, but you know, I'm, I'm flexible. Um, <laughs> but, but I agree with you. Like we talk about all of these things and then, um, you know, uh, she just started fifth. He just started eighth. But I remember when I used to drive like when they were littles and I used to drive my daughter and our neighbor Alex to school and they would count or pick them up or whatever. They would be like, mommy, do we know all the bad words? And I was like, I don't know how many words do you know? And like, you know, and then <laughs> they would get started. And then um, my son was like, well, does that my old, you know, so was that what about compound words? I was like, what's a compound word? Like <laughs> asshole. I was like, oh. Oh my gosh. Um, fortunately, until the pandemic, they did not know all the words. Like the words that really pissed people off, they didn't know. I believe they know them now, but like just like my kids know, like, if something really bad happens and you swear in front of me, I'm not gonna yell at you. But it's not yeah. it should be, it can come out of my mouth, but you're not old enough. And then we all know not to swear in front of dad. So that's an emotional intelligence, I think, which is the point of speaking openly about that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and really, as long as they know like when it's appropriate to use those words and when it's not, I think that's, that's the key thing we need to teach. And we're not going to prevent them from knowing the words or using them, you know, in some form. And if we, if we weaponize them and make it so that like, they know how much we hate when they say something, then that they're just going to use it when 100%. they want to make us mad. So yeah. I, I totally, yeah. I mean, yeah. my sure. kids are allowed to say whatever they want in their rooms. I mean, you know, there's a difference though, between like really, really hurtful language, which we talk about, you know, please don't use really, really hurtful words as you know, just because they are so, so strong and powerful, but, but like, you know, shit and asshole and whatever they can say in their room and they can say if they're upset. I mean, I'm yeah, but we yeah. know that like, they shouldn't say it at school in front right. of our teachers or they're going to get in trouble or they shouldn't say it in front of Grammy and grandpa or 
<laughs> they're going right. to be mortified. Like they know that just the social graces and the what's a, what's culturally acceptable. Right. Um, you know, I feel like I skipped over the how to talk to your kids about race. And I think that's important. Um, tell me more about, I guess, what you learned and also what, how do you incorporate this into your daily life, you know, rather than um, like, how do we actually put that into action? Because yes, I discuss not being racist and we, you know, they've been exposed to, um, but they're not exposed to much. I mean, I'm in a really homogenous, you know, white, a lot of white and Jewish, and I guess we're getting what I would call better, what other people will not, but in that we're getting some more diversity. Um, I, I don't think my kids actively pick friends based on the color of their skin, but as you pointed out, like, they're definitely aware of who, who we socialize with, and uh, although we socialize with no one anymore, so. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but so, I guess, what's, you know, what do we do as sort of white privileged women to explain to our kids other than telling them, which doesn't actually always, I feel like it needs to be more, don't you? Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't think it has to be something you bring up like every day. I no. think a lot, yes. some of the, uh, some of the people who are very vocal about like critical race theory, not being in schools they're for whatever reason, they think that like what we're what, what I'm saying or suggesting is that like, we're constantly talking about race and we're constantly shaming our white children for being white or, and that is not at all what I'm advocating for. Have you I'm ever asked about. someone who's anti-critical race theory, what critical race theory is? Because 99% <laughs> of the time they can't explain it. They have no idea. Oh. I mean, it is complicated. Like I've read a lot about it, but I, you know, I don't, I'm not a scholar of critical nothing. race theory. And I've read, I've read nothing about it. And like, not for lack of interest, but just because it's more amusing to me to not know anything and then ask people, I'm not against it. I like, sh there's gotta be a reason, but ask someone who's against it, why yeah. they're against it. And they're going to tell you it's, they're just like Trump, 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 Trump. Yeah. They are going to say things that aren't true about it. Yeah. They just don't understand what it is. And they've been told it's something it's not. I mean, the rhetoric about what it is is so inaccurate. And anyway, yeah. So, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and what, and I don't even mention critical race theory in the book, because really what, I mean, what I'm talking about is what's rooted in the research on, you know, kids and the development of prejudice. And that's kind of, I mean, it's related to, but it's different from critical race theory. So um, I guess I'll start by just explaining what the science suggests in terms of why we should talk about it. Cause I feel like that's not always in intuitive. I think there's a lot, as I said, like a lot of, especially white parents have this very well-meaning belief that if we don't talk about race, then our kids won't notice it. They won't see skin color. They won't treat people differently based on skin color. They just won't become racist. And that I think is a, like a reasonable assumption to make on some level. Like that's, that kind of makes sense if on some level, but it only makes sense if you believe that people don't see color. Yes. And I, that's not I true. Don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, I'm just trying to, because I know, I, I imagine some listeners are going to have thought this and I just want to say like, I get why you think this and I, and I know it's well-meaning and you're not trying to do, and you're trying to do what you think is good, but what the research suggests is actually, yeah, that kids, even babies see skin color and they respond to it. Um, there've been studies with three month olds that show that three months olds will three month olds will look at pictures of adults who share the skin color of their caregivers for longer than they look at other pictures. And essentially that's a sign that they kind of prefer looking at people with the skin color of their caregivers. So, the, but that shows that, you know, they can distinguish it. They can tell the difference at a very young age. Um, how come, and, like, how come that doesn't, how come that isn't a, a, oh no, because it's the same color. Okay. My thought went to novelty, like a novelty, but that's not what we're looking at here. Cause it's the same color. Yes. They, yeah. It's not a novelty thing. They, yeah. I mean, that's certainly something they probably had to make sure that they were controlling for and whatnot. Um, Which I'm sure they did. I'm not doubting the research. I, right, right, right. I, I think I sort of misheard initially, but um, but they have to see color. It's it's a it's a biological survival skill dating from caveman days. Yeah, know? and They're, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, what one of the big, also important, like 
foundations of understanding this is that kids are like one of their big jobs is to really like figure out the world around them, figure out what social categories matter, what, what different features matter, like what, what's important. Why does the world look the way it does? And so first of all, they see skin color. And second of all, they then notice at a pretty young age that there is this really salient racial hierarchy in our society where they can tell that, you know, people who are white tend to have more power and privilege and wealth than people of color on average. Um, and they notice things like that. There's only been one president who is not white. Of course, they notice the gender the hierarchies as well with the fact that there's never been a woman president, but that's a different topic. Um, but they notice this and the problem is if if we don't talk to our kids about the fact that this hierarchy exists in large part due to racism yep. and and then kids are going to try to figure it out for themselves they're going to try to say okay well so why does this hierarchy exist why do so many more white people have money and power and they you know and they see it in like even their schools probably where the white kids are maybe more in honors classes and they might have nicer cars and clothes if we don't explain that that's racism has gotten us here, Yeah, yeah. then they will come to the simplest conclusion, which is honestly like maybe white people are just better and smarter. So that's one of the key reasons like we need to be talking about it um, because otherwise kids will make these inferences that are very, actually very prejudiced. And we see from the research that even with, you know, toddlers and preschoolers, they might not do this at home necessarily, but when researchers have spent time at preschools, even like diverse urban preschools and watched what kids do and say on the playgrounds, white kids are saying racist things a lot. And like, this is still happening. I talked with black um, preschool educators for my book and they said, we see it all the time. Like white kids are saying things like you only white kids can sit on the swing or like your skin is too dark to sit next to me at lunch. All these things are coming out of their mouth. So we know that they are making these kind of interpretations of what they're seeing and their interpretation is people with dark skin are not as good and I shouldn't hang out with them. Um, it, so that's like a simple, I mean, that's simplified. It's more complicated than that. There's also a lot of other things going on that make kids kind of jump to conclusions about race. But, um, but that big question you asked is like, how do we do this? How do we talk to our kids? And I think there's like, there's a couple things um, I mean, one is, I think sometimes we don't notice when our kids give us opportunities to talk about race, like when they, um, they allude to skin color in some way, or they say like, oh, that, you know, they'll be in the grocery store and like make a comment about somebody's hair or skin color being different. And in those moments, we're often totally mortified. Um, uh, and like, we're embarrassed that our kid mentioned skin color in public and we'll often like shush them and tell them like, don't say that that's not nice. Or, or we'll kind of downplay their observation. Like, oh, well, yes, she has darker skin, but it doesn't matter. The skin color doesn't matter at all. We're all the same on the inside. And right. we'll, we'll kind of respond in these ways that our kids interpret as us saying like, we don't want to talk about this. It's not okay for you to talk about this. It's not okay for you to make these observations. Um, please don't bring it up again. Like, and, and they very quickly, like, and, and also like, oh gosh, and race is bad. Skin color must be bad because mom doesn't want me talking about it. And it's not okay. Like, this is a really touchy subject and it must mean something bad. So then they, this sort of fosters, continues to foster this like idea that gosh, skin color is some bad thing. And, um, so really like when our kids give us these opportunities and mention in passing something that's like related to race or skin color, we should respond yeah. like normalizing it and respond calmly and say, yes, she does have darker skin than we do. Skin color comes in all different colors or skin comes in all different colors. And that's really cool. And you, I am the science nerd who would then go into like explaining why skin color varies. Same, over same. Melanin. I think it was interest, yeah. <laughs> Well, right. Yes. But, um, but, you know, instead of like jumping down their throat to shush them up, we should just let them have a conversation. You know, we should have a conversation. And if we don't feel comfortable doing it in the middle of the grocery store, we can like bring it up later and say like, let's talk about what you noticed and like, let's, and, and really just make it not a taboo subject make it something that they know they can come to you with questions for. And then once you've kind of opened up the lines of communication, then sometimes kids will then come back with more questions. I found this when um, like my daughter had seen a picture, I think on the newspaper, on the cover of the newspaper that was related to protests related to George Floyd several years ago and asked me like, what was going on in that picture? And, you know, I could have glossed over it and been like, oh, there's people protesting for right. something. And instead I was like, oh gosh, I really need to have this conversation. And we talked about it for a while and what had happened to him. And, 
um, and what the protests were. We talked about Black Lives Matter, all these things. And then like she kept coming back to me over the course of the next few weeks, like asking more follow-up questions, wanting more information, like ask, you know, and, and so once I kind of, once we make it clear, like we're there, it's okay to talk about these things, then they will come more and more. Um, but also like, if you don't know how to, if your kids aren't bringing it up or you feel like there, there's no opportunities, you can make the opportunities by getting books, by, you know, having your kids watch shows that, or movies that are related to race and skin color, and then using that as a way in to talk about it. Um, there's kind of, there's all different ways that you can help it along if you want to have these conversations, but you're not sure how, or if you're not sure how to frame them, you can, you know, get books and, and learn from the language the books are using in terms of like how to talk about it. We could buy your book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that too. Yes. It's, it's interesting. My rule has always been when they ask the question, they're ready for the answer. You know, not always the full, you know, the full blown answer of like the history of porn or whatever, you know, but like uh, when they ask the question, that's when I give the answer. You're, I don't disagree with you saying like introduce it, especially if you li do live in like a very homogenous neighborhood, neighborhood and there's not a lot of diversity. And, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I definitely remember when I went to college, there were people who had never met a Jewish person they didn't think they really existed and I was like a very confusing uh, you know thing you know um and so it, it, race and religion are different obviously but at some point I would have felt badly as their parents had I sent my kid away to college without teaching them something you know um my big joke is my parents taught me to drive but they never taught me how to put gas in the car so the first time I had to stop for gas, I was like this schmuck asking the, uh, you know, I don't, there wasn't a gas, I don't know if there was a gas attendant or just the person next to me or someone like, I'm oh, man. like a moron, you know, I had a brand new car and no clue how to fill it. Um, so there is something about wanting to make sure your kids aren't dumb or <laughs> yeah, like ill-informed, but not, I mean, my kids are both very smart, but then again, it's about some things. Um, not so much. I feel like your son is similar to my daughter um, and then vice versa with the other ones. As I was reading, I was like, I recognize all of this. So oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. Which is another way you make yourself extremely relatable by telling the truth about, you know, no one's perfect. Your family's not perfect. Your kids aren't perfect. You are not perfect. <laughs> and that's not our goal. Right. You know? um, yeah. Uh, another thing that I really liked was when you were talking about bullying and how you were, you're at this like conference and you and this other woman are looking at each other as people are asking questions and you're like, why the fuck does no one think their child is the bully? You know, yeah. like, and it's true. This, the biggest bully in fifth grade, I, I can't say I hate a kid, but she's a bully. Um, and so, her mom's also a bird bully and her dad's an mm -hmm. asshole, so fine. But um, mom is constantly complaining about this girl bullying, being bullied. And it's crazy pants. Um, and I don't know how people don't know. I mean, I don't know who my children are apart from me. Like I get some feedback, but you know, when you raise a child without, you know, rules and like limits and you know uh and or when you raise a child the best way possible sometimes kids are susceptible for falling into it you mentioned that you got a call from a principal because your son had um not instigated it but said you know in some way participated it and um it's funny because my daughter had mentioned that there was a boy being picked on in her class last year and I asked who was doing it and when I was given the names one of them was one of my friend's sons and I felt comfortable enough with her you can't do this with every friend but I okay. called her and said I gotta tell you something this is what's going on and again he's not starting it but I, I know you and I know you you know she, she raises great children and he is a great child he just got sucked in and you have to be able to have a conversation you know um why is it so difficult besides narcissism, why is it so difficult, you know? Like, like. Yeah, I know it, it, it is really interesting. I mean, everybody worries that their kids are going to be bullied and almost nobody worries their kids are going to be doing the bullying. Um, and 
I think it's in part because we have these misconceptions a little bit about what bullying is like who bullies what it looks like how it kind of works I think I love like, that you pointed this out in the book so okay tell, tell people because it was fantastic yeah yeah so I mean I I think certainly I have always kind of assumed that like bullies are like if you if you think of somebody who bullies like they know exactly what they're doing and they're just nasty like they just want to make people sad they're miserable kids like and they're like, they're just bad eggs. And I think when we think of bullying that way, of course, we don't assume that our kid could ever be a bully because we don't think of our kids that way. Like our kids aren't these nasty creatures who are bad eggs. Like nobody thinks of their kids this way. And in fact, but that's not what bullies. And I, I actually hesitate to use the word bully because it's such a like, it's, it implies also that it's a fixed trait. And it's, I, I prefer to say like kids who engage in bullying, although that's such a it is sort Mouthful. of a fixed trait though. Science shows it is sort of a fixed trait. Well, but, but some of, but whether the research that I uncovered was suggesting was like, it's a continuum. It's not a black and white thing where you're like always a bully or never a bully. There's kids right. who sometimes engage in it. Like one day they will be bullies and the next day they will be bullied or, you know, they're kind of on the sidelines, um, supporting people who are bullying, but like, aren't the instigators. There's all sorts of gray area where that's where a lot of the bullying happens, where, where it's, yeah, it's not one kid all the time bullying everybody, but it's like, occasionally this kid will pick on other kids, but sometimes he will get picked on or she will get picked on. Um, there's just like, a, it's a lot more messy, I think, than parents give it credit for. And I think that's part of why we have trouble thinking that our kids will ever be bullies because we don't think of it as this sort of messy continuum. Um, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting was there's research too suggesting that some kids who engage in bullying really don't understand that what they're doing is that hurtful. Of course, there are the bullies who know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> I feel like I had one of those when I was growing up and he got pleasure out of putting, you know, putting everybody down and being cruel. But there are a lot of kids who engage in bullying behavior that like really just on some level don't get that what they're doing is hurtful. And it's because in part, they lack the skill theory of mind, which is essentially the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and, and take the perspective of another child. And, um, and often these are kids, when I interviewed bullying researchers, they said, well, not often, but sometimes these are kids whose parents are very like jokey and teasy and, you know, kind of have that like dry sense of humor and they're kind of their kids pick up on that and develop that too, and start teasing other kids thinking it's like all in good fun, but really what they're doing is having a negative impact on the other child and the other child's really hurt. So this is all to say that like bullying is not always what we think it is. And it doesn't always look the way we think it is. And kids don't always mean to be hurtful. So the, because of that, I think one of the most important things we can do as parents is even if we think we have like angel children and they could never do any harm, we should talk about bullying. We should talk about the fact that sometimes intention is not the same thing as impact, that we can yeah. say things when we don't mean to be hurtful, but the other person really is hurt by them. And we should try to kind of, you know, and, and you can talk about like times when maybe their feelings were hurt by another child. Like remember the time that that kid, you know, made fun of your glasses and that hurt and, you know, and maybe he didn't realize what he was doing was so hurtful, but it really hurt you and try to get them to understand that, um, you know, what kinds of behaviors can be bullying, why it's not okay to, to bully and, you know, and that, and that sometimes what you say can have more of an impact than you realize. And to just have these discussions and not make assumptions that your kids would never, ever do it. And therefore you don't need to talk about it. Right. I mean, there's also another thing and I'm, I mean, social aggression research is there's actually, there's, it's not just one bully, one victim, it's the bully, the victim and the people that don't that either go along or don't intervene. And yeah. so, you know, your kid may not be the bully, may not be the victim, but you can also, I think I want, you know, like I want to encourage my child to be the kid that does intervene, you know, or, or not go along with the meanness. And so to me, right. that's where the gray area where, um, it depends on the child, but that's the gray area where, you know. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it does depend on the child. Like some, some kids won't necessarily be able to stand up to the bully. And I mean, right. that's, that's a risky thing to do in many ways, depending on the bully and what they do in response. Um, but also what, what really came out to me in the research was like one way that kids can support victims of bullying that is not so costly and scary is to just 
be there for those kids who have been bullied, like sit with them at lunch, go up to them afterwards and just like stand near them, show that you support them. Cause when teens who have been bullied have been surveyed as to like, what's the most, what's the best thing that kids did to support you when you were being bullied or after you were bullied, they said like, they just they just sat with me at lunch or they just came up to me after and they didn't even have to say anything about what happened. They just showed that like they were aligned with me and they were there for me. And like that really, really helped. So if you have kids who, you know, I mean, I'm not sure I have my, my daughter's like super socially anxious. I don't know that she'll ever be able to stand up to a bully. I mean, it depends. Yeah. My son will not either, which is a shame because he's tall and he's, you know, um, but my daughter, will and has and then it's great um actually this girl that i was talking about this fifth grader several years ago pre-covid times my daughter was walking down the hall she said hello to this girl because i know her mom like again you know she said hello to this girl and and this girl goes hi yourself ugly face and when she my daughter when she came home i literally was gonna cry or or punch I can't throw a punch, but you know the feeling. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I said, All right, how did you feel? Because I'm a fucking shrink, you know? And she goes, I know I'm beautiful. She's just a bee. And I was like, yeah, you're right. She's like, you know. That's awesome. um, but I, I will say another thing is um, last year, there was this boy in her class who I heard from a friend, this boy was getting picked on and the kid, the kids had a rough couple of years. Like we lost a parent a few years ago. And so, and this is fifth grade. So, you know, um, so I, I was like, well, who's doing the bully? And I, I, and then I called the parents that I knew would be receptive and was like, let's make this like a, I didn't make a word for it, but like a circle, like a protective bubble of like, make them try harder, you know? And so like, apparently it was, actually helpful and like you know my daughter would make a point of doing more and these other kids and you know if you can talk to the parents call the parents like they're still ours are still young enough where I think parent involvement is appropriate um although I would want someone telling me no matter how old my kids are but I also think yeah. that at some point they need to learn independence so right right that's great that's that's an awesome approach. <laughs> uh, it was all I could think of besides punching people. And again, right. But much more constructive than that. So well done. <laughs> Completely. Thank you. I'm also the one who trolls the Facebook page and going like, nope, that's mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'll say. I'll just point out like, uh, you know, someone the other day was like, I don't mean to bash anyone, but it feels like the PTA did a really bad job this year. I was like, Psst, that's bashing. That is absolutely bashing. Yeah. Oh dear. So adults bully too. They just do it on Facebook and think they don't have to have consequences for it. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, it's, a <sighs> it, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> it, it's a lot. I'm looking through, you have so many great strategies. <laughs> One of them I don't like though. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Which one? Don't rely too much on rewards. I understand. Uh but I don't know that I agree. Then again, one of my top three fights with my spouse was when my son was younger, I was pregnant and biting had become popular in in his class and he bit me or kicked me or something. And so I quickly put together a sticker chart and my husband was furious that I did this without him. He's got got weird, you know, Um, but don't rely too much on the words. I'm a shrink, that's everything we've, you know, but I get it. I like the, I like, I do sort of get it, but explain that because it, it does make sense. Well, and I mean, I hope my opinion on it was somewhat nuanced because as, as I explained yes. in the book, like I have used rewards many years with my kids. We saw a psychologist who recommended that we set up this whole point system with our son. We used it for like a year and a half, I think, where points were basically like we would give him points for pro-social behavior, like for cleaning his room, being nice to his sister, whatever. Um, And those points would turn into a minute of screen time. Each point was a minute of screen time and one cent towards like an allowance. Um, And it worked really great. And so I am not completely anti-rewards. And I think think they can work really well, especially in in situations where kids are being asked to do something they really just don't wanna do and it can really be helpful. Um, But when I really dug really deeply into that research on 
the long-term impact of like a lot of rewards. I think, again, it's not going to like ruin your kids or anything, but what I found was evidence that over time, the use of rewards can diminish kids' intrinsic motivation for doing things. Like it might make them just a little bit less motivated to do those things without rewards. Um, and it's related to like, they think a sense of feeling controlled. Like if we use rewards a lot, it feels controlling and kids and adults don't like feeling controlled. So there can be this way that like they will, they, they might then sort of think less of that activity in the future if they've been rewarded for it, like think less like on a sort of level of their own interest in it. Um, and that's specific. Yeah. And that's specific too, to um, activities that they might get some satis like intrinsic satisfaction out of. Like um, this isn't that research, the research does not relate to ask, like rewarding your kids for doing things that they really, really, really can't stand. But if it's something where they like could get some satisfaction out of it, like there was one study where researchers had kids who liked to draw um, and they gave half of those kids who liked to draw rewards for drawing and half of them, they didn't give rewards. And then like a couple of weeks later, they invited the kids to draw again. And the kids who'd been rewarded for drawing were then less interested in doing it a couple of weeks later. And because that was something they liked doing. And then when they were rewarded, it kind of like interfered with their own reward system of like, well, I don't know, what do I like this? So I think, I think it's subtle. I don't think rewards are going to like screw up your kid. As I said, we use them regularly for years and our kids are fine. And then we stopped and actually, and, and that wasn't as difficult of a transition as I thought it was going to be. Um, and I also think that one other good thing about rewards that I found is it really helps to create habits. Like, yeah. you know, if you have given your kid a reward for cleaning their room every morning or, you know, in some way, yeah, given them some kind of reward, like then, and then it's just something they do every morning. And then that's just a nice habit that they have built and that sticks with them. And so, wait, so sure. Uh, kids clean that room every morning. They, um, they used to, now they don't, they used I to I be really impressed because this, yeah. Well, this was back when we were using points. And I think we had this thing where like, they would get 10 points for having their room clean before they went to school in the morning. And they did it a, a lot because again, that's a powerful reward. And, right. and they got in and they did get in that habit for a long time, but now, now the habit has degraded over time. Um, and it's not so much a habit, but it can be helpful for like creating these good habits. And, and actually, I mean, some of the habits that we set up with the point system, I think still exists. Like my kids still clear their plates after dinner. It's just very automatic now, you know, it was something they used to get points for, and now it's just what they do. Right. This is what you do. And so it's helped. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, my opinion is nuanced and in part because like I have used rewards and enjoyed them and thought they worked well. So, but I'm a little more aware of like the long-term effects of them now. And I think about them when I'm thinking about using rewards. It's so interesting like, though. You also mentioned um, uh, the dreaded music lesson practice. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. We, my daughter has always been like musical. She's very dramatic, you know, theater camp. And, um, and uh, when the kids were little, we had them taking, before COVID, we had them taking music lessons and getting them to practice was such a pain in the ass. I'm like, it's just too much drama. And then my husband would make it go too long. Whereas like, you know, and then they're just miserable and then there's tears. And so, um, yeah. What happened was over uh, over the course of like the pandemic and everything else. Uh, long story short, I got scammed by the lure of a free piano and lost like thirteen hundred bucks. And because I'm a schmuck, and then um, my parents felt really badly because I cried because I was, didn't want to disappoint my daughter in the middle of COVID, mm -hmm. and. Um, I was supposed to be a surprise, but she heard me screaming hysterically and yelling when I found out that I've been scammed. And so they oh, bought no. her a piano. <laughs> so um, uh, they bought her a piano and or they bought us a piano. And now it's not, there's no forcing. It's just like, there's a, there's no lessons either. But it's like, yeah. there's the piano and she writes music on it. You know, like she'll just go over and write music and write songs and do, and sometimes it happens several days in a row and sometimes it happens several weeks, but either way, I don't have to push because there's no practice and yeah. it's a huge weight off it. And 
I think she's enjoying it. So I, I do see the value. I get it with, with that. Um, I just feel like when the kids are little, you need anything to hold on to, you know? Yeah. I think it, I think they are very useful when kids are little. And as I said, I use them too. So I think it's, it's just something to keep in mind. Like if you get to a point where you're like, I think we can get away with not using them as much, then, you know, then maybe think about not using them as much, but I don't, I don't certainly don't advocate for like, you should never, ever, ever use rewards. And I know there are people who say that. And those are the, also people who say that you should never, ever praise your kids. And I don't agree with that. So oh, no, I don't agree I with think, that at all. I mean, the sort of black and white, like you should never do. I mean, I think we shouldn't like hit our kids and spank them, but like, there's so many, so much parenting advice that I think is so black and white and so like severe. And I don't think that's constructive. Every family is different and every kid's different and like different approaches work for different kids and et cetera. So anyway. No, I agree with you hundred percent. I mean, which is why I love this book. That was my only sticking point, but I also understood where you were going with it, but I think it's interesting right. because it's counterintuitive to what so many of us have been told. Yeah, no, I know. I understand. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yes, so there's, again, just to sell this book, cause I really did like it. Um, you give selflessness strategies, you give motivation strategies. The overlying message of all of this research is talk to and engage with your child while your phone or laptop or other electronic device and their electronic devices are not around. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, talk about emotions, educate your children about emotions. And also, oh, look, I keep going, don't assume <laughs> things, you know? Um, and. And those things are huge and I, I, it's difficult. And I, I understand as a parent and as a shrink, and yet I also see the value of this. Um, you know, when I cry, I cry and I tell my kids why I'm crying, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm angry or when I fuck up, you know, I, I apologize yeah. and say I was wrong. And these are all ways and examples we're setting for our kids, like, I, I do, uh, yes, I do the PTA because I want them to see volunteering and also I want to know the principal and I want to get in with the higher ups. So, you know, I don't know. So my kid will be saved if there's a fire in the building, who the hell knows? But it's also to show like, these are things mommy does for, um, yeah. you know, for others. No, mommy has a job too, although this one hasn't stuck in into their heads yet you know why do you have to work mom seriously never oh yeah me. I get that too yeah. I never asked my husband that though never. no they never asked my husband that either and it's it's insane but um <laughs> but this book is really so helpful and I really hope you're gonna write another one eventually because it's fucking exhausting so <laughs> yes it is it is a lot but it was fun though I actually really enjoyed it and I do want to write another one although I have no idea what it will be. People are telling me to write about the teen years and like focus a book on like getting through that. I don't know I, if you I have ideas. Think, I don't think you're there yet only because I think it helps to have your own. Right. Day. I think that's true too. So that not be, that you couldn't hard. do it, but this book was so wonderful because you speak, it's like, you're one of us. And so we right. all get the, you know, to experience yeah. it together. Um, we're going to put this in the show notes and show them the show notes. Um, but where can people buy the book? Where can we find and follow you? All of those things. Yes. Okay. So the book is really available at any bookstore. It's on Amazon. It's at independent bookstores. We have um, bookstores? <laughs> I know it's amazing, right? Um, there's also an audio book that I read, um, which is on audible and wherever else you can get audiobooks um, and an ebook. And my website is kind of like a one-stop shop where you there's purchase links for the book. I also have a newsletter, a free parenting I signed newsletter. up for it right before. Yay. Yes. Oh, yay. It's called, is my kid the asshole? And um, right now I'm ex actually going to be expanding it soon, but right now I'm essentially addressing like parents questions on challenging kid behavior. Like why does my kid hit me and what do I do about it? Or why does my kid turn into a monster after they use the iPad? What do I do about it? Um, and again, all using science. Um, and so you can sign up for my newsletter through my website. Oh, anyway, the website is Melinda And really everything's there. And to, uh, my Instagram and Twitter, you can find there too, to follow me. So thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. This was so fun. I agree. Oh, wait. Oh.